but John 20, 19 to 23 is our text. John 20, 19 to 23. I'm going to read it and just, just share two thoughts from this passage just to encourage us this morning. We're continuing our series in the Gospel of John. We're almost done, just another chapter, but we'll see how long it takes for us to finish that chapter. But 19, John 20, 19. When it was evening the first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said again to them, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. I'm going to ask you a question, and I know it does, this does not apply um, to you right now, but before coming to Loft, because I know this doesn't happen here, have you ever sat in a service and you just looked around and you just said, man, is this all there is? Is this it? Um, maybe it was a Sunday where the service just seemed flat. Maybe um, the sermon was just really long. The pastor said he'd be short and ended up going really long. And you just started looking at the phone and saying, this can't be what this is about. This, there's got to be more to our faith than this. Or the music was off. Or maybe you've been in a church before here that's had a high level of conflict. There's a lot of strife. There's a lot of division. There's arguments that are going on. And you became disillusioned with church and all that was happening. And the question has come up, is this all there is to it? We just, um, several of us in leadership are reading this book by Francis Chan called Letters to the Church. And in his book, he asks this question. He says, imagine you find yourself on a deserted island at nothing but a copy of the Bible. And you've never, you grew up on this island. You were there by yourself. Now I don't know how that happens, but just picture it with me. Um, and the only thing there is a Bible. And somehow you're able to read it as well. You've got no experience with Christianity whatsoever. And all you know about the church is what you have read from the Bible. How would you imagine a church to function? Would you close your eyes, he says, and picture church as you know it. Now think about your current church's experience. Is it even close? Now, the reality is, if you guys have asked that question, many of us that stand up on this stage as pastors have asked that question as well. Eugene Peterson, um, phenomenal writer, writes about the dreams that pastors have about ministry. They actually start pastoring a church excited that God's going to use them, and then they realize that every church has toilets that break, and you have to write sermons every week, and there are sinners in the pews. And, and to make it worse, they discover that the pastor himself is a sinner too. And you might have asked yourself the question sometime in your church experience, is this all there is? Is there more to this? And our text this morning reminds us that the answer is no. This, if you think that church is just simply what happens on a Sunday morning gathering, there's more to that. What happens here is good, but there's so much more. Some of us were primarily grew up in circles where everything was about Sunday mornings, about worship, and as primarily churches about what happens when we gather together on Sundays or whenever we gather together as people. And this morning, I want to look at this passage that we just read to reorient us to who the church is called to be and what the church is called to do. And it's far more important than what simply takes place in a gathering like this. Now, understand that I'm not criticizing gatherings like this, otherwise I'd be out of a job, right? I'm saying, though, that being the church and doing what the church is called to do takes more than just simply us gathering together week in and week out. And I want to look at this event that would shape our church in terms of two critical pieces of information. I'd like to look at who we are, our identity, and what we've been called to do, our mission. Verse 19, on the same day he was raised from the dead, Jesus began to prepare his followers for what would happen when he left. The, 19, the ex event we're going to examine is, takes place just hours after Jesus was raised. 
This was the first time that his disciples had seen him after the resurrection. His followers were locked away in a room out of fear of what the Jews were going to do. They were going to be killed because Jesus was just killed a few days ago. They're afraid. And they're probably feeling pretty bad about themselves. This hasn't been a good couple of days for the disciples. Not only were they afraid for their lives, but many of them left Je let Jesus down. One of them denied Jesus three times, to one time to a servant girl. Others fled. They heard the news that Jesus is alive. Mary had come and told them, and some of them are doubtful right now. Others were afraid of, man, if Jesus is really alive, what is he going to say to them? How is he going to respond? Why weren't you there when I needed you? Why would you run away? And they're worried. Jesus could rightly come into that room that morning and tell them off over the ways that they acted over the last few days. And all of a sudden, Jesus appears. And when he does, a couple of things that look forward to his ascension and that shape our understanding today of who we are and what he's called us to be, he begins to explain to them. And let's look at what happens. The first thing that Jesus does, he, number one, he reestablishes a relationship with us. The first thing that Jesus does, he reestablishes a relationship with us. Verse 19, the evening of the first day of the week, the disciples were meeting and gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. And Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be to you. You know, Jesus could have said, Man, I've got something to say to you. He could have condemned them for abandoning them. He could have criticized them for hiding. He didn't come, though, with a word of condemnation. He came instead with an everyday greeting. Peace be to you. And now in English, that sounds like he's saying a lot of stuff right there. That's not how we greet people here. We're, hey, how are you? Hi, how are you doing? In that culture, not just back then, but even today, this was a standard greeting. Jesus came in, and he simply said the equivalent of hello. He repeats himself in verse 21. He says, peace be with you. He knows who he's dealing with. He knows their doubts. He knows their failings. And here, and in other conversations with his followers after the resurrection, he begins to reestablish a relationship with those very normal people. He doesn't write them off. He doesn't dismiss them. He doesn't reject them. But he reestablishes a relationship with them. See, here's the thing that we need to understand about Jesus. Jesus is very aware of our shortcomings. He's very aware of our sins. He's very aware of our failures. I don't know if you've ever heard the term imposter syndrome before. The imposter syndrome is a psychological term referring to a pattern of behavior where people doubt their accomplishments and they have this persistent, often internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. Now I think there's a thing called spiritual imposter syndrome to think that God has chosen us due to some misunderstanding, that he was actually going to select the person to the right of us, but he accidentally hit us, and now we're stuck, right? God is stuck, and he can't go back on it, so we're stuck, and somehow or another that we're going to be exposed as a fraud one day. That if God really knew the truth about us, if God knew all of our failures, if God knew all the things that we were going to do or have done, that he never would have chosen us. And of course, we know that God doesn't have any illusion about us, He's never surprised at the times we let him down. It's not some misunderstanding by God that he, when he, um, it's not some misunderstanding that God looks at our lives and he understands all of our weaknesses because of what Christ done f has done for us. He's able to say to us, peace be with you. You know, when I first started in ministry, I would remember when people would come to me and they start confessing their struggles and their sins. And to be honest, it was a complete shock to me. I thought for sure that because I was in love with Jesus, he would only send me good, godly, Christ-fearing people that never sinned and that um, never messed up and that they would help me to grow a church into this big mega church. And boy, was I in a shock when I realized that God sent all the saints to the church down the street and not here. Um, we need to remember that Jesus is never shocked by what we're struggling with. He's not surprised. He's not overwhelmed by our failures. Our doubts don't shock him. Our sins don't surprise him. He knows. And he still comes to us. Even in our failures and in our fears, 
And he establishes a relationship with us. He even understands and reassures our doubts. Verse 20, he says, as he spoke, he held out his hands for them to see, and he showed them his side. Jesus is not surprised by your sins and your doubts as he looks to you. He has no illusions about who you are and who I am. And friends, that has to be huge for us. Because this has to form our identity, our understanding of who we are. We are, before anything else, a community of sinners who are in a relationship with God, not because we have our act together. We are a community of people who are in relationship with God because Jesus looked at us in our weakness and he said to each and every one of us, Peace be unto you. We are a community of grace because, friends, we have received so much grace. See, this is how I primarily understand who we are as Lost City. A church isn't a building, it's a community of people. I told you the story before... um, when I was disillusioned and discouraged by like the original years of the church when it wasn't growing, by God's kindness, he sent me on a mission trip to Kenya. And in Kenya, we were, um, they woke us up one morning and said, we're going to church. And so we got ready, got excited to go to church. And so they let us out of our um, rooms that we were staying in and we went to church. And the church was under a tree in the open sun. No mic system, no instruments, no um, chairs. We were sitting on the ground, not even a mat or anything to sit on. We just sat there. And the people were the most happiest people in the world because they were worshiping their Savior. And it hit me right then. The church isn't about how big we grow or how much stuff we have or how well music sounds. It's about a community of people that gather together and declare that Jesus is our all in all, that we are a community of people that are in relationship with God through Jesus. We're not in a relationship with God because we're better than anyone else. We're in a relationship with God despite our weaknesses and our failures and our doubts and our insecurities. Jesus has no illusions about who we are. He looks us into our lives and he says to each and every one of us, peace be with you. Friends, this has to be the basis of our identity. It shapes everything about us. It also means that as we come in contact with others, we don't go, ha, you're a sinner, I'm a saint, that Jesus loves me more. We live as those who have been forgiven so we can live with grace and joy and peace and hope. We should never live in arrogance as followers of Jesus. We should never look at other people and say, why can't you get your act together? Because... If it wasn't for the grace of Jesus, we wouldn't have our act together. Friends, this is who we are. A group of people who doubt, who fail. But a group of people who God in his kindness said, peace be to you. Restored a relationship with us. It is important, but it's not enough. Jesus something else, does something else as he meets his followers. Second thing, he sends us into the world. Jesus reestablishes a relationship with his father or his followers, but he also gives us a job to do. One, if you're honest about it, is unbelievable. Considering every failure that these disciples have, and considering every failure that you and I have, and he passes almost like he passes this baton to them and says, "All right, my job is done. Now it's your turn," and he gives the job over to us. And this is the opposite of what you would expect, because. Just hours before, just days before, these people failed the test. Now Jesus comes and he gives them the baton and says, All right, now go run with it. Go love people. Go share the gospel. And he puts them in charge. He looks at us and sees who we are. And he still gives us the responsibility of doing what he did during his ministry. Look at verse 21. Jesus said again to them, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I also send you. And after saying this, he breathed on them the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And we'll dive into that last section on another time because there's just too, too many things there. But I just want to see that we have been sent into mission. He restates his mission as the Father sent me. Jesus, in the Gospel of John, talks a lot 
about being sent by the Father. Over and over, he talked about the reason for his existence, the reason for what he was doing. As the Father sent me, the Father sent me. Jesus served because Jesus was sent. He preached because he was sent. He healed because he was sent. He forgave because he was sent. Because this is what God called him to do. Jesus was always clear on his mission and what he was supposed to do. And Jesus accomplished this mission by going to those who were outside of relationship with him. He talked about not going to those who are spiritually healthy, but to those who are spiritually dead. His ministry was grounded in the nature of God, who is ascending God. And you can capture this in Scripture. One of the big themes in Scripture is the image of God. That God made all of us in the image of God, the Imago Dei. But the image has been broken by sin. And God has been working to restore that image, to undo the damage caused by sin. And the Bible tells us that we are being changed into the image of Christ, who is the image of God. He is restoring the image of God in us through Jesus. Another big theme in Scripture is the mission of God, the Missio Dei. God is on a mission to restore that image. The whole Bible is about the mission of God, that God would choose an individual by Abraham and say, hey, Abraham, through you and your descendants, I am going to bless the earth. And through the descendants of Abraham, through the nation of Israel, he says, I'm going to separate you from the world to be a blessing to the world. And he chooses a people to carry that mission into the world. And God sends his son through that people group to carry out that mission. And then Jesus gives the mission to those who follow him to the glory of God. See, this is what it's all about, the mission of God to restore the image of God in the people of God for the glory of God. It's all about God. Jesus knew his mission. And then Jesus gives us his mission. As the Father sent me, so I send you. He gives us that mission. This wasn't just for the apostles in John 20. This is for you and I. This is why the church as a gathering place is not enough. Church is both a gathering of people who have a relationship with God that has been reestablished by Jesus, but it's a group of people who's also been sent by God into the world to live as he lived, to serve as he served. Friends, this is the reason for the existence of our church, a group of people. It's rooted in the very nature of God. God is a sending God. The Father sent Jesus. The Father and the Son sent the Spirit. The Father, Son, and the Spirit sent the church into the world. Well, City, we're a gathering of people. But it's more than that. We're a gathering of people who have been sent into this world, our world, to do what Jesus did. We've been called to enter the lives of people who are out there. We've been sent to leave our places of security, to risk ourselves, to love people. Maybe for some of you to travel to places where people have never heard the gospel. Others to go to your jobs, to go onto their turf rather than expecting for them to come to our turf. All of us in this room have been called to become missionaries in our societies, to understand our culture, to creatively engage the issues of our day. We've been sent into the world just as Christ was sent. Now, I find it fairly easy to remember who we are. Imperfect people that have been restored into relationship with Jesus compared to remembering what we're called to do. It's so easy to focus on our relationship with Jesus and forget about being on mission. Just as Christ was sent, so also are you and I sent. You know, when we forget our mission... That's when we begin to ask the question, is this all there is? Is it just a simply gathering place of people? A church cannot exist without a mission. Mission is not an add-on to our church. It's not a special project that we do. We will do events, but our primary job as a church is to equip you so you would live on mission. You hear me say this week in and week out, You've got friends, you've got family, you've got co-workers, you've got roommates that don't know Jesus, and I will never be able to get to them. But God has put you into their lives so that through your life and how you live and what you say, they will encounter the living God. There's no such thing for a church such as a missions budget. The entire budget of the church is about 
equipping each of us, one, to love Jesus with all of our hearts, to love our neighbors and our community with all of our hearts. The essence of the church is to live in a relationship with God, sent into the world just as Christ was sent into the world. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Terminal. Um, it's about a man, Victor, who travels to JFK Airport in New York from his native country, Kravoshia. And Victor gets stranded at the airport because when he lands, his country back home is split apart in a civil war. He's not allowed into the States because he doesn't have a country to call his own. And he can't be deported because there's nowhere for him to go. And he ends up living at the airport. When we remember who we are, but we forget our mission, we become like Victor at the airport. We're not home. And it's easy for us as a church to get into airport mode. Gathering together to wait for our flight home to see Jesus. Maybe even trying to get other, a few other people to come sit with us at the terminal. And maybe occasionally we'll send out representatives from the airport to try and recruit others to join us and just wait for the plane home. Friends, that's not what God is calling us to do. Jesus never said, hey, now that you know me, isolate yourself and just wait for me to return. He said, as you go into the world, love your neighbors, love your community, love the people around you. He never said, separate yourself. He said, go into the world. Jesus has called us brothers, sisters, to something different than that. Jesus has sent us into the world just as he came into the world. He calls us to leave the airport, to see our calling as those who have been sent to live as Jesus lived. You think that's too much? See, this is why Jesus would breathe on them and he would say to them, receive the Holy Spirit. That's significant because he's given them everything that you need to live on mission for Jesus. Friends, each of you, God has called you. He's not surprised by your mistakes. He's not surprised by your doubts or your failures. He's called you. And he's given you the job to be sent to live and serve as Jesus lived and served. Can I just say that God has more confidence in us than we have confidence in ourselves? That he has put us on this planet at such a time as this. It was his sovereign decision to insert you into planet Earth during a time of huge transition. It takes incredible faith to lead and follow Jesus during hinge points of history. And Jesus doesn't slam your doubts or your fears or uncertainties. He wants to encourage you in your current assignment to live for him. There's some of us in this room that have been ordained as pastors. That's what we have been ordained to. And... That's the calling that God has given us. But some of you have an, have, a, have an even higher calling than that. You've been ordained as teachers. You've been ordained by God as students. You've been ordained by God as workers, as administrators, as nurses, as doctors. You have been sent to where you live and you work and you study just as Christ was sent. You're not here by accident. God has strategically placed you there. He's given you every resource that you need. You, friends, have been sent. You are in a relationship with God and sent into the world to be a blessing to the world. And so I want to ask you as we close, who are you? Who are you? Who are we as a church? And the answer has to come down to these two words. We are forgiven. We are sent. We're forgiven. We're sent. Who are we? We're people that have been forgiven. We have received more grace than we deserve. We're people that have been sent. Through the love that you have received, you are called to extend it to those around you. And this, my friends, has to change everything. Let me close with this confession that I believe of who we're called to be as a church. We believe that we're the church, that we're a community of God's people called, set apart to be a witness to the good news of Jesus Christ. We are blessed to be a blessing. Just as the Father has sent his Son into the world for the sake of the world, Jesus has sent his church into the world for the sake of the world. As you prepare your hearts for communion, would you examine your hearts? 
Is your identity first and foremost found in Jesus? Do you know that you are loved, you are forgiven, you are accepted? Do you know that he knows your failures, your weaknesses, and he still says, I love you, I forgive you, I accept you. The second part of it will not make any sense to you until you get that first part right. If this morning you're not sure about your relationship with Jesus, we have people in the back that would love to pray with you, would love to talk to you about that. Before you come up for communion, would you go visit with them? Would you know before you leave here your identity is rooted not in what other people say about you, but is in what Jesus says about you? Other people will put all sorts of labels on you. They might call you a failure. They might call you a screw-up. They might call you a mess. They might label you by every sin you've done in your life. Jesus doesn't. He calls you son. He calls you daughter. He calls you beloved. And he speaks this morning words that says, Peace be on you. Would you let that sink in before you come to the table this morning? That you're here not because of how well you performed this week. You're here because of how well he performed on the cross. That there's grace for you. Jesus has given you grace. And he's given you mercy. And would you let your identity be shaped by Jesus? Maybe you're here this morning and you know that. You know how much Jesus loves you. You know how much Jesus has accepted you. You know your identity you're hesitant on living on mission. You're hesitant on saying, hey, what will people think about me? Can I encourage you? Can you begin small? Begin small. Just begin to start listing out people in your life that don't know Jesus and start praying for them. Saying, this person, if I'm honest, doesn't know Jesus. I want to pray that God would give me an opportunity to talk to them to point them toward Jesus. Begin there. I'm not telling you go and tell everyone about Jesus tomorrow and take the Bible and beat them over the head with it. That's not what I'm inviting you to. I'm, but I'm inviting you to think and remind yourself that you are called to live on mission. There's people in your life that don't know Jesus. And Jesus has put you into their lives. Co-workers that don't know Jesus. Family members that don't know Jesus friends that don't know Jesus. And you have to ask, why are they in your life? Because you are sent once. You've been sent. As a church, if we get this, if we get that we, our identity is in Jesus, that we're not here to perform so that God would accept us, that we are here because Jesus has already loved and accepted us, we, it's become so much easier to accept people around us and their shortcomings. But if we get that, we become a church that's unified and in love with each other and in love with Jesus. And then when we get we're on mission for Jesus, we become a vibrant, energetic church that we see in Acts that everywhere they went, the gospel spread and people came to know Jesus. I would love to see that. I would love for our church to be like Acts where people were coming to faith because the church was just on fire for Jesus. They were just passionate about Jesus, that they weren't ashamed of the gospel of Jesus. And so it's my prayer as your pastor that we would find our identity in Jesus. That we would be secure in knowing who we are. That we'd be a church on mission for Jesus. That we would be so in love with Jesus that everyone knows how much we're in love with Jesus.